Democratic lawmakers on Capitol Hill are working to pass a much narrower version of the once ambitious Build Back Better bill, while the White House continues to navigate how best to secure abortion protections after the fall of Roe. To discuss the political stakes of all this, I'm joined now by Tamara Keith of NPR and Annie Linsky of The Washington Post. Amy Walter is away. Welcome to you both. Thank you for being here. Thank I think you. it's fair to say that was a very sobering report from Laura Barron Lopez there. Tam, we have covered, you have covered individual moments like that for years. When you see it pulled together like this, what does it say to you about this moment we're in as a nation? There is a rising fear in many corners of this country that political violence, that, that the country is just crackling and, and ripe for even worse political violence than we've seen thus far. Um, also, I will add that the QAnon conspiracy theory is full of violent imagery, of uh, fantasies, of uh, assassinations of political enemies, you know, a long list of political enemies taken off to Guantanamo. That imagery is very much part of QAnon, which is very much part of the political dialogue uh, in America on the right. Um, and, and it can't be ignored. And you say on the right there because it's a key point to make. Annie, we just heard there uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell say, look, it's up to the voters to decide if this is acceptable to them or not. It is clear the Republican Party now houses these kinds of conspiracy theorists, uh, extremist ideas, authoritarian ideas. Yeah. Do you see anything among leadership or on the electoral landscape that would change that? Yeah, I mean, that was such a powerful report. And I think hearing Mitch McConnell's response, which is essentially, let's let the voters decide, is a unique um, response on the, on the Republican side. I mean, I think um, Tam is absolutely right that the QAnon theory certainly does have this imagery. But, you know, we have all been to political rallies where, um, you know, emotions run high and, um, and you know, I've been at Democratic uh, events where certain you know, people in the audience become, all, you know, say violent things. And the difference is the leadership on the Democratic side will tend to turn the volume down a little bit rather than sort of stepping aside, which is what McConnell is doing, or what some of the other people in the candidates for office in that report are doing, which is really just fostering and normalizing the kind of extreme violence that we are not, um, you know, used to in modern politics. Do you feel like it's become normalized on that side, at least? I mean, it's you just see so many of those ads, and you're also not seeing the response from the leadership. And to me, those two things, the sort of silence or even the sort of gentle nudging in that direction, mm -hmm. um, combined with it just seeing more and more of it, I mean, that is the path to normalization right there. Well, we've seen, of course, Democrats come out and condemn it. The president has come out and condemned it several times over. But he's also, of course, got an eye on this quickly closing legislative window. I think it's fair to say, and when we talk about Build Back Better, first of all, it's a phrase we haven't heard a lot of lately. Uh, this is not the ambitious plan they, they once put forward. So what does it mean right now, essentially, when you look at the fact that this plan was brought down by a member of their own party, by Senator Joe Manchin? As President Biden has said many times over the last year and a half, in a 50-50 Senate, every senator is president. And Joe Manchin has a, every senator, including Joe Manchin, but especially Joe Manchin, has an outsized vote on these matters. The White House is seemingly willing to try to bag any win that they can get. And so they have pivoted from not really wanting to talk about defeat on the on the climate measures that were being discussed and, and sort of holding out hope, but I don't know what kind of hope they're holding out, uh, to talking about what Joe Manchin will support and what President Biden will take, uh, which is um, it, without congressional action, there is going to be a cliff, a huge spike in Obamacare premiums that would hit millions of American families as they're dealing with higher prices on so many things and right before people go to vote in the midterms. So that would be kind of a political nightmare if that uh, is allowed to happen. So this legislation they're talking about, this very, 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 very paired back legislation uh, would take care of that Obamacare, Obamacare cliff mm -hmm. and would also allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. Uh, details obviously still to be worked out. Uh, <laughs> problems could still arise. But the idea is these are two things that affect Americans. And it's something that Democrats could campaign on as long as they leave out the fact that this big, bold, build back better 
went away. Those are necessary caveats. So details still to be worked out. Things could still change. Annie, what's, what's your take on this? You know, I have to say it's sort of very fashionable right now among certain people to, you know, talk about what a terrible job Joe Biden is doing. I mean, his approval rating is awful. Um, and this is a much smaller package than he had conceived of and he had talked about and his people had talked about. That being said, I, you know, for this to pass a, a cap on prescription drugs, I mean, it would actually be quite a big win. I mean, even though it's not the giant win, it's not the like medium win, it's still a win. And it's one that, you know, Democrats and Republicans, you know, have diabetes. They both pay for high costs of insulin. And this is the type of legislation that could, you know, help certainly around the, uh, around the edges and perhaps more in the midterms. Tim, what about the White House response in the fallout after the fall of Roe. They've faced a lot of criticism for not having something ready sooner to respond to that and secure some of those protections. What are they saying about that? So it, it seems as though this White House, and, and the fall of Roe was just the latest example, but the, this White House is, is sort of unwilling to flaunt their executive authority. That, that the president, you know, other presidents do executive actions that amount to basically glorified press releases, but they treat it like a really big deal. And this president has executive actions. Now maybe there is some criticism that they maybe waited a little bit too long on the executive actions to respond to the, the Supreme Court decision. But um, you know, instead of trumpeting it, President Biden and his team emphasize that, well, their powers are really limited. There's only so much they can do. and it, and. It almost seems like they're headed down that path on climate change related administrative actions as well. And Annie, in the House, of course, we've seen Democrats taking what action they can. They want to yes. show they're trying, right, even if it doesn't go anywhere in the Senate. But the most coherent message among Democrats right now just seems to be, look, if you want these rights protected, show up in November and vote. Is that fair? I I think that's certainly what's coming from the top of the party. Um, I think it's absolutely not enough for voters. And even you're seeing lawmakers who are, you know, state legislators really pointing the finger to Washington and even to Joe Biden himself, to even to President Biden himself, and saying, this is not enough, do better. There's one lawmaker in Texas who came out and said, look, we need a little bit less Washington and playing nice from Joe Biden and a little more Texas, a little more of a rough, uh, you, you know, edge here. And so they want to see a fighter. And I think, to Tamara's point, I mean, this was not a surprise by any means. And so for Biden to take so long to put out an executive order that surely had been prepared well in advance um, is, is sort of mind-boggling to a lot of people. He's just really an imperfect messenger on this particular issue. Um, and has left a lot of Democrats sort of wanting more. And when we say too long, we should point out, so the leaked draft of that yes. uh, ruling came out in late May, right? The decision in late June, it was two weeks, as my recollection was. And, that, and yeah. even when the court yeah. signaled that they were pick, gonna take the case, I mean, yeah. arguably there was an entire year to prepare. Um, and, and certainly ever since the leaked decision came out, there, it was clear that this is, was a pretty good signal where the court was going. Now, this is during those two weeks, President Biden was on an overseas trip uh, dealing with Ukraine and, and other crises. And then uh, just this last week, he was also on another foreign trip. So he's had a very busy travel schedule. But, you know, this is a White House as every White House who says they can walk and chew gum at the same time. Do we, are we likely to see any other action from them on this front? I mean, I, I don't think so. I, it's hard to see at this point. I mean, I think they've kind of emptied the arsenal. But, I mean, Democrats are still pushing. And if there's anything that this White House has responded to, it has been being pushed from their party. And also, it may not be, a, you know, a signed executive order. It could well be actions taken at the, uh, at the agency level that don't get as much attention, unless they were to, you know, tout it. Which they are likely to do, too. Mm -hmm. Who knows? We will follow it all. It's certainly very important. Tamara Keith, Annie Linsky, thank you to you both. You're thank welcome. You.